happy, I'm satisfied. Um, I think this has been a, a very good exercise over the last week of showing the community the possibility. Beckham soccer on the ballot. Miami voters are going to get to say yes or no to Miami Freedom Park team co-owner Jorge Mas with us live. I've covered the issues. I have been, I have studied them. I know them well. A journalist jumps into politics. Candidate for Congress Maria Elvira Salazar wants the GOP nomination in Miami-Dade's 27th district and she is with us live. We don't want to elect someone just necessarily from the private sector who's never been tested in the public sector. It is getting testy in the governor's race. Who's up, who's down? We will take it to the round table. Good morning, happy Sunday to you. We begin with the four year odyssey for Major League Soccer in Miami, now in the hands of Miami voters. And also in the crosshairs of the critics, they say Miami Freedom Park just is too big, gives away public green space for a fraction of its value, and there's also a pending lawsuit. A tense all day commission meeting this week ended in a three to two decision to take it to the voters whether to bend the rules for Beckham and allow a no bid deal to be negotiated for a billion dollar major league soccer business and entertainment complex at the city owned Mel Reese Golf Course. Driving the project for Team Beckham is Jorge Mas, the Miami businessman who is co-owner of the soccer team and real estate development. He is chairman of Mas Tech, an enormously successful infrastructure construction company that's now in the Fortune 500 and still the chair of the Cuban American National Foundation. Yes, yes. Thank Jorge, you, Michael. welcome. Thank you, Good morning. Thank so you. glad you are here. All right, you won. My pleasure. You and Team Beckham won a big victory this week, three to two, to get it on the November ballot. Why should the voters of Miami, what would they get if they vote for this? Well, I think it was a, a big victory for our city. And let me explain, explain why. I think that first, we're going to be activating a park for our city of Miami residents. It'll be the, the largest park in the city of Miami's inventory. I think most importantly, the, the city of Miami residents and, and all of us in South Florida will be getting an iconic destination. But more importantly, I think they will derive huge economic benefits to our city. It will produce in the interim 11,000 construction jobs. It will produce over 2,400 um, living wage, good paying jobs. 11 um, to $15 an hour for those people? Yes, sir. Um, it will be a, a phase in minimum, but I anticipate that that it will probably be fifteen dollars and up given 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 the market and i think most importantly we will be giving the city of miami directly in excess of ten million dollars a year um, which, which which i think is an important fiscal positive fiscal impact for our for our city all right can we get into right into some of the big criticism you yes. have faced the team yes. and the commission has faced as well mm -hmm. that this is being done uh, the, uh, to a largely distrustful public because they seem to think it's been done behind the scenes, a no bid deal done very quickly. That The term sheet actually went to the commissioners at 2 a.m. the night before and, um, and largely done by not going through the process and understood it was the commission who brought it to you. It's the commission who decided to give it to voters, but you have to answer to that, to that public who is not trusting that this isn't a giveaway for a billionaire to make more money. Yes. Let me preface by answer by saying that I am part of that distrustful public. Um, you know, I witnessed the Marlins deal. Um, I happen to know the Marlins deal very well. Um, and I thought it was a disastrous transaction for our community We're talking about and Marlins for our Park, the stadium Marlins Park, for yes, the baseball team. For the baseball team, not the team itself. Uh, yes. For the, for the baseball team. When we first started looking at this, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that it was a very different process than what had taken place with Martins Park. Number one, that it was something that the voters could decide on, something that was actually beneficial with no taxpayer dollars coming in um, to this project, and, and trying to do something very different because I, as an owner, believe that a stadium on its own is not an economic generator. But let me get into the process, which is a question you asked. Um, we have been as very, very transparent with this process. We have nothing to hide. Uh, first of all, it is a, a deal where we want fair market value paid. Um, you know, we have followed all of the, the city procedures as, as we have been told uh, to, to follow them. So on a process point of view, I think that there is no better process that can end up than having and letting the voters decide. Can I jump in and simply say, yes. how was fair market value determined? Did independent appraisers look at this project and say, we believe 
the $3.5 million a year in lease payments or 5% of, I guess, the gross, the gross revenues. Yes. You know, is that fair? Yes. The city uh, hired, the city hired uh, two independent appraisal firms. Um, I believe uh, C.B. Richard Ellis and I believe Blake and Associates, mm -hmm. they came up yeah, with a fair... Yeah, outfits. Yes, yes, they came up with a fair market value of the land. So why not go at... He, okay, this team is the only possible entity with an MLS soccer franchise to offer to Miami. Yes. So that said, aside from all the, the other development, hotel, business, well, a complex, a park, why not go out for RFP since, frankly, you're the only team that could meet an RFP and do it by the process that the city has, has laid out legally. Why not? Well, first, the, the Melrose Country Club has been put on RFP before. Twice. Uh, uh, twice, on two separate occasions, with no bids uh, coming in. I think that this is a very unique proposition. Um, but, but why not do an, a third RFP and meet the conditions and then do the deal. Because that would take the city making a substantial contribution in remediating the property and participating as an investor in this property. Um, the reason that this works as a unit is number one, we're gonna be providing uh, a park, we're gonna be providing soccer fields for youth, we're gonna be providing a remediated site. So those are elements that would entail the city having to invest in order to derive fair market value and do an RFP um, which if you start separating the parts, what we've been told on multiple occasions is that, is that it will be an unsuccessful RFP. Uh, to drill down city. just a little yes. bit on the soil. This is yes. on, on soil that has incinerator ash beneath it. Yes. It's toxic. Nobody yes. really knows how toxic it is. You have committed, what, $35 million towards remediation, making it uh, acceptable for building a large commercial project. And a park, yes, sir. We have we have we have thirty five million dollars uh, that we've committed to. Uh, we've also committed to the no city. No tax dollars. No tax dollars from the city, irrespective of the amount. If if for some reason, because we do not know yet, we should know by by mid September, the exact amount or range on on the remediation. I have assured the city they will not pay one You're penny eat for it, remediation. Whatever it is, we will eat it, or we will find other sources that are not city funds. And originally, you had stood up in front of the commission and said it could be a hundred million or more. Then the second meeting it was thirty-five. What what happened between those two meetings? What, to bring when it down I was so referring much? to the hundred million dollars, it included the site development. It included all of the infrastructure involved. Right. Meaning, my meaning there was it's a very expensive site to get prepared for vertical construction, but. But the remediation numbers that we've been looking at have been anywhere from, I committed to 35, been anywhere from 30 to 40, but I'm, I'm very confident we can get it done for that amount So this money. goes on the ballot with a listing of, for the voters to decide yes. whether, whether the city can go forward without going out to bid. That's what voters will be voting on. Yes. And, and on the ballot, they'll see the components of the deal. But what, what has not been done yet, as far as my take from watching this meeting, was there hasn't been a comprehensive traffic study. There hasn't been this, like a, whatever you do prior to development, a cost development, a cost analysis, yes. um, a feasibility study, but traffic is, a traffic study is really gonna be a big deal in that area with 836 being a nightmare on a good day. How do you go forward with this grand plan without the details of those studies? We will have the details of those studies. Obviously, it's, it's upon us now to show the voters, uh, to convince them to vote yes. Uh, there will be a very detailed traffic study. We had done a traffic analysis before, which is not as comprehensive as, as a study. We are going to do a study to ensure, number one, that the economic engine of South Florida, which is our airport, has no disruption with this project because we cannot afford traffic jams getting into our airport. I am very, very sensitive to the fact that the neighbors who are to the east not be affected by any type of traffic patterns. And some of the unique things of this site is on three sides, it's, it's commercial. So I think from what I've been told um, and the experts in the traffic world, but I want the public to see that, uh, that, that, that traffic should not and be an issue. Jorge, on the eastern side, 37th Avenue, yes. uh, on the other side is Grapeland Heights. These are, it's a really nice middle class single family home development and a lot of those people i've gotten emails from them saying nobody ever came to talk to me they're just sort of foisting this on us when are you going to go into that neighborhood hold meetings say here's what we've got in mind we've started that effort this past week um, we're going to continue to do that i would personally like and i've invited every neighbor and we're going to be scheduling a lot of meetings i want them to feel part of the process frankly it's their park to design 
um, they should be involved in the design mm -hmm. process. They will be the principal users probably Absolutely. of that part. Absolutely. And one of the studies that we have is, uh, you know, does it affect their home values? And, mm -hmm. and the first economic study I've had is that their homes will increase in value, an average of $11,000 a home. So these are the ty type of information I want to share with the neighbors. I'd like them to be part of the process and, and, and frankly that they be, you know, champions for this project if they, if, if they so feel. So you are already searching and hiring for the team. Yes. And, um, you know, aside from I don't know how to do business, it's not my thing, but I'm going to guess that that's not the cart before the horse and you're not fairly sure that it will be sent to uh, back to commissioners by the voters and you will get the four to one vote from commissioners again. That would have to be the no bid deal approval and that they will. I mean, you're expecting a win here, obviously. Um, I've, I've lived my life with optimism uh, and drive and, and I have a dream and I have a vision. Um, I'm confident that, you know, as a Miami boy, that, that we will be able to make this happen. And, and, you know, we are running the business of a soccer team. We're very close to naming our, our first general manager and, um, and looking forward to showing the city of Miami what's possible. Yeah, Jorge, uh, this is a $1 billion project. It would be one of the largest shopping, entertainment, office complexes in the city of Miami. Uh, how much skin do you have in the game? Well, I'm the, uh, I'm the majority owner of the team, uh, along with Marcelo Claure, Massa San, and, and, and David and, and Beckham and, and mm -hmm. Simon Fuller. So we have a lot of skin in the game. Um, we believe in this. If not, we wouldn't be approaching it this way. Uh, so so we, we have a significant economic stake. And, and the follow-up there is you I knew your father, I know your family, I know Mostec, you know, a great reputation in our community. And you want a legacy. I think you, this is more than a project for you, isn't it? It's, it's more than a project. I think it's something that we can leave our children and grandchildren. They can indicate to somebody dreamt and make that happen. I don't measure my legacy only because of a concrete project or soccer. I think I want to leave a legacy that I left a Miami place, Miami a better place than when I was born in Mount Sinai Hospital on Miami <laughs> Beach. <laughs> Thanks for the plug for yes. Mount Sinai. <laughs> uh, well, it's great to have you here. Thank um, you, and we appreciate you answering questions. I know that you have been very accessible to us and, and will to us being the public's questioner, and yes. we appreciate that as it goes forward. Okay. And uh, appreciate your being. Always. Thank and you before very much. it's over, we'll have you back. Absolutely. Man. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Jorge. Thank you. Appreciate it. Up next, we're going to sit down with one of the leading Republican candidates for Congress in Miami. Maria Elvira Salazar is here with us next.
with the announcement of the retirement of Representative Ileana uh, Westlayton, a gaggle of contenders suddenly appeared from both parties. They stepped forward trying to claim her seat in Congress. And in fact, we've had many of the candidates right here, and we have that opportunity again today. Maria Elvira Salazar is a veteran reporter and anchor on Spanish language television. She is a Republican from Coral Gables who's running for public office for the first time. Welcome. Great to have Thank you here. Really Wonderful to answer. be here. I love your set. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you have you. a lot of experience on TV well, sets. Well, that's correct. Yeah, that's the way I made a living for 35 years. Well, and that and is... Now? Now, well, well, yeah. now, journalism, to, you know, you, you are the one who asks the questions, and now you want to be the one who has the answers. How is that going to happen exactly? Well, I'm going to mm -hmm. try to answer the, as best as possible with the truth, not as the way the politicians... Uh, we have heard the way they have answered for so many years that sometimes they talk, they talk, they talk, and they don't promise. I'm not a politician. I'm a journalist that has stepped up to the plate, and I think that's the way I can serve my community best. At a campaign event on Friday that I attended at uh, Casa Wancha, Wancho in Little Havana, you made immigration a prime topic. And you said, I'm just going to sort of summarize briefly what you said essentially was that the 11 million people who are in this country undocumented but have lived and worked and not broken the law there should be a way for them to have legal residency in the u.s now your opponents would say wow that's amnesty what do you say oh no no that's not amnesty what i'm saying is that the system allowed for those people to stay 7.7 .7 million people out of the 11 million undocumented that live in this country do not have a criminal record and they have been living here for more than 50 years. I believe that there is an overwhelming agreement in the Republican Party that those people need to have some type of legality. I'm not talking about citizenship. I'm not talking about amnesty. I'm saying to give them some legal... Legal re resident status? But not, but not enough of the agreement in the party for there ha to be enough votes to pass any kind of reform. The Republican has Party it. has an outstanding opportunity to be, or President Trump, to be for immigration what Nixon was for China. If we want to be, it could be done because the base has been taken care of. Let's secure the border in, in any way, shape, or form, and let's, let's give some legal status to those people that without a criminal record that have stayed here. And then let's put, let's put to rest this immigration mess that uh, it's, it's really creating chaos yeah. within yeah. the party and in, and, and in the country. Excuse me. And the corollary here are the thousands of people in this community and across the country uh, from um, uh, Haiti, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, who have come because of natural disasters, the earthquake in Haiti, who are here under TPS. But that is ending for all of them by July of next year, you are saying they ought to be able to stay as well? If we have an immigration reform law, we'll take care of the TPS recipients, we'll take care of the DACA, the parents of the DACA, the unaccompanied minors, the everybody that that is part of this mess that we're talking about. Okay, but so as long as we're talking about this and the rhetoric that you don't want to continue, how? Because the devil is in the details of those things. And so how do you take care of all those people and still come up with some immigration policy that many in this country will not consider to be amnesty? That, that's been such a difficult thing to get over. By so how, what are the details of how to we do that? We were talking about the dreamers at some point. We were talking about giving the dreamers from 10 to 12 years a type of legal residency. Well, we could use that to give the dreamers, obviously, their parents and other people that are helping the economy. Because also we have to understand that sometimes with the low unemployment we have at this hour, sometimes we have more jobs than hands. You know, Maria, we've had, uh, there are so many people in this race. There's uh, between Democrats, Republicans, and an, and an independent. And so many people have very similar views about all of these issues uh, along party lines. You know, the veteran Congresswoman Ileana ross Leighton is a moderate Republican, um, had a very successful tenure, very big on human rights, civil rights. Take an opportunity and distinguish yourself. How, how do you align with that? How do you differ from that? What makes you different from the rest of the Republicans in this race? 
Well, uh, I think that you would have to ask the voters. Well, you and We're look and you. look at the and look at the polls. Oh, come on! You you know what sets you apart? You think you are qualified? <laughs> you you've got a graduate degree from Harvard? Well, the uh, Kennedy School. I yeah, mean, he's you know, answering the question. You know. <laughs> uh, no, well, I mean, well, go ahead. I, I think I have uh, I have the trust and the uh, credibility that I have earned for 35 years uh, in this community. Uh, with the because they have known me and have covered those stories with utmost integrity so i think that the possibility of having done that i've been a a personal eyewitness and that empowers me yeah. uh, in the eyes of the voters and in the eyes of washington to take those stories and try to change them yeah. for the better well one of the stories that you did among hundreds was an interview i think 1995 with fidel castro it may have been the only interview i think uh, he gave to an American Spanish language journalist. That's correct. Although Bernadette Pardo did stop him on one other occasion. Anyway, one of your opponents in this primary, Stephen Marks, has turned this into a advertisement. And let's run a little bit of it. It is in Spanish, but it shows you in 1995 interviewing Castro. And the point that he's trying to make here is that you seem kind of smitten by Castro. You're smiling, you call him a world historic figure, a revolutionary, and Mr. Marx seems to be saying, you know, she's not tough on Castro. Oh, come on, despicable what he's doing. It's despicable because that editing has been manipulated because the translation is not correct from English to Spanish because the ad has two minutes. Um, I have been one of the, probably the staunchest and the most, um, one of the most um, hardest critics of the Cuban revolution on the air, Spanish television, as you said, and for this guy to come and say that I am a communist, I mean, I am livid, not only because it's it's conniving, because it's not true, because it's manipulated, uh, that the video has been manipulated, and on top of that, my attorneys have asked the stations to pull it off from the air because it does not comply with federal rules. But let me tell you something more, it's very suspicious because it's very conniving how, and it's so very suspicious. suspicious. in terms of where the money came where, from that's to correct. run this? I, I'm going to leave that up to you and for you to do a wonderful investigative reporting that you've done. But in reality, what's happening here, and if, if to come and, and, and accuse me of being a communist and manipulating the story in that interview, that it's an hour long and it has many segments where I'm very tough on the dictator. So it's it's I'm I'm very I'm very upset. Really quickly before before we run out of time, TV time you know all about. Oh yeah, that's uh, right. In the news, a the tyrant, the <laughs> the president's meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin, and apparently his invitation to visit uh, the United States with him. W weigh in on that from your perch as a GOP candidate in South Florida. Trump is a very unconventional president, and I've said uh, many times over that we have to pay attention to what he does and not, I mean, to what he says and not what he does. I am enamored with the system and with this country. I believe that the American electoral system uh, worked, he won by the rules, and he was the result. We need to treat him with respect because he represents the institution of the presidency. Represent the office? The office of the presidency. Presidency, yeah. And, 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 and I understand and I have reported on Trump for, for a few years now. And we know that some people do not agree with what he's saying, but I still believe that we should not use any personal uh, insults and we should treat that the, the Oval Office, and as you said, the presidency with utmost respect. You know why? Because there is no other country in the world like this one. We have institutions, we have Congress, we have the laws, we have the courts, we have the Supreme Court, we have yeah. the press, and we have the bureaucracy. Yeah. And we have the Congress, and you want to be part of it, so... And I, will be, and I will be calling him out whenever I have to, but I will be saluting him whenever he does something good for the United States. Great to have you here. Maria Wonderful. Lara. Thank you so Great much. To pleasure. Have you here. Invite me more often, please. Well, Perhaps we'll invite you back with the Democratic nominee debate. if that's the way sure. it turns out. Whatever the voters <laughs> say at the end. All right. Thank, Thank you so very much. much for your invitation. Thank you. And next up, all the big topics of the week right to the roundtable. Stay tuned.
It is that time again, time for some informed <laughs> analysis and measured opinion on the week's top news stories with our powerhouse roundtable. As always, we have a great one for you, so introductions first. Nancy Ankrum is the editorial page editor of the Miami Herald. Welcome Michelle Kaufman, longtime sports columnist and writer for the Miami Herald, whose specialty is sports and soccer, the first South Florida reporter to interview David Beckham. And welcome back, Ed Pazwoli, the president of the Tripp Scott Law Firm in Fort Lauderdale and a very influential voice in the Republican Party. Great to have you Good all. Morning. Good morning. Great to have you all here. Good morning. Hello. So soccer, Michelle, we've, uh, we've both, and um, you first, interviewed David Beckham. We've interviewed Jorge Mas. Things have gone so many places in the last four years, and here we are with this plan that a lot of people say is beautiful, a lot of people are dead set against because of the process that has taken place or has not taken place. Weigh in on that. Uh, yes, it's been quite a saga. I've actually covered this saga for 20 years now since MLS. Since you were nine. Real, since I was nine years old, <laughs> yes. Uh, MLS in 1996 was demanding to have a team in Miami. Miami is the number one soccer TV market in the country. Uh, the World Cup that just ended, Miami led the entire nation in English and Spanish language uh, coverage combined, viewership. And so this is a soccer crazy town. And MLS has wanted a team here for that long, wants Miami to be the gateway team to Latin America. They think that fans in South America will, will you know, support the team in Miami. But it's very, very complicated because of the politics. This, the league wants the stadium to be in the city limits of Miami. They don't want it to be out somewhere west well, or south or north. The, they want it on the waterfront. They, they first want it on the waterfront. They wanted urban core. The words that were used first were urban core, urban core. Now they've stretched a little bit farther from the urban core. This is now the fifth site that they're trying to get, the fifth site. And yes, the, the big question here is, uh, you know, the golf course, should it be a golf course, should it not? The, the pitch is that it's going to be a public park now. It's going to be open to everybody. You'll be able to have picnics there. You'll be able to jog through there. You'll be able to take your family to a soccer game. So they, the people who are in favor say that it's more open to the public than a golf course, well, which is what it's been right now. He, right. Here's, what, um, here's what I'm hearing from the, the biggest critics. Okay, great, MLS is coming. We're going to get soccer in a stadium. But what's going on in this plan, Ed, is that the soccer stadium is a mere excuse for development uh, at Mel Reese. That, that's what I'm hearing critics say. No, it's a development plan. And let's understand, part of the development plan is the key component is the soccer stadium. But there's something different going on here, I think. You have now local... Uh, key local people who are from Miami, Jorge Mas and others now, are bringing real credibility to this. This is not uh, Jeffrey Loria, you mm -hmm. know, part two. Right. Very different. This is very different. Yes. So there's a certain level of credibility that he brings and that the group brings in addition to the flash of David Beckham. And so I agree I that MLS, those are yeah, much different. MLS, MLS basically asked David Beckham last winter, said this deal is done unless you find a local partner. Right. Right. We need someone who really understands Miami, who knows yeah. how Miami works and how Miamians think. And, 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 and Jorge, and Nancy Jorge Mas is a really credible figure, but the process, you, your page the has raised questions about the process. Right, it is the process. The uh, plans were played very, very close to the vest leading up to the initial um, city commission vote on whether to put this on the ballot, and they punted until commis each commissioner was able to wrangle what he, what he mm -hmm. wanted. Well, three of uh, them anyway. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. all you needed, three. Right. Again, it's, it's, it's an attractive, it can be an attractive and successful development. However, will the city commission, will city leaders be good stewards of what is public property. We have seen things head south in this community because the city commission just kind of threw things over. Watson Island is the prime mm -hmm. example. Jungle Island is the prime example of, um, of uh, a, an institution that could not live up to its promises and that the city of Miami really hasn't forced to. And people are very skeptical. People are just, they, well, first of all, the word stadium, finally. the word stadium is like a four letter word in this town. <laughs> <laughs> you say stadium and people just immediately put up yeah. an X. So they really have to prove that this is different from the Marlins. This is fully f privately funded and this and that and that their intentions are right and that the taxpayers are not going to be 
take it to the cleaners for it. And, and there is a lot of skepticism, and they are going to have right. to between now and November. They have a lot of they have a lot of uh, lobbying to do. to do. Well, let me and, talk about the process, though. The process isn't that the commission just voted and now mm -hmm. it's going to happen. No, it's voted to put on the ballot, right. and so now it's going to be subject to a campaign of some sort where people are going to be able to decide mm -hmm. what is good for the city if this makes sense. Right. And so mm -hmm. I think that's democracy in action. And so let this now be put before the voters, up or down. Let's go. One hundred and ninety-three thousand. 300 and something Miami voters right. have this in their hands. Have this right. in their hands. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And a lot of questions need to be answered. And again, the question is stewardship and process. And uh, again, we really need the, 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 the city leaders to hold everyone's feet to the fire here. Yeah. We've seen failure before. Well, we have invited and will get uh, Mayor Francis Suarez on the program, but he's not voting on this. But he is wholly in favor of it. But he's all in. Oh, yeah, he he's is. fully all on right. board. Hold yes. your thoughts. We'll be back, talk more about soccer, governor's race, other things, whether the Dolphins should be able to kneel or not. You want to hear this, so stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. We are in the midst of our roundtable. And Michelle Kaufman, let me ask you, you have covered soccer for so long. You know it so well. The premise to this whole David Beckham team Beckham thing is people, a lot of people, are going to go fill up a 25,000-seat stadium at least, what, 17 times? 17 each? regular season games, 17 yes. regular <clears throat> season. Will they do it? I absolutely think they will. Uh, this is this sport right now in this city, I think, other than the Miami Dolphins and well, the, even ahead of the Miami Dolphins with the younger generation. But soccer is huge in Miami. You just saw during the World Cup, every restaurant was you know packed right. with people watching and the top TV ratings. The biggest question, honestly, is the passion. Miami fans know soccer like nobody's business. I mean, Miami Miami fans are very savvy. They know what top level but, soccer is. The but question they want is top level. Right. Soccer. The question is, will that passion for the international game translate to our domestic league? 
The fans in Miami are not following MLS right now. They're not. They're following La Liga in Spain. They're following the English Premier League. They're following the World Cup, the Champions League, the South American Leagues. They're sitting at home on weekends watching all their favorite players. They know the lineups of every team in the world, but they're not necessarily watching Portland against Kansas City. Mm -hmm. So the question is, one of after they get this stadium issue resolved, the next thing is going to be to convince the soccer fans of Miami that MLS is worth watching because right now it is viewed somewhat as a second tier league to the leagues around the world and the fans in Miami know what a good team looks like. Now, the way that they say they're going to do it is A, David Beckham says that he's going to be able to lure some very, very big name players to this team. And, and is already working on And is on already that. working yeah. on that and that there are players around the world in Europe and South America who want to live in Miami who want to have a condo overlooking the bay, and some of them already do, in fact. A lot of soccer stars from Europe and South America already vacation in Miami. Yeah. They have condos in Miami. So right. it's an attractive place for international soccer, mm -hmm. and but they will definitely have to convince the, the Colombian fan, the Argentine fan, yeah. the Brazilian fan who lives in Miami that rather than staying home and watching your teams on TV, you're going to go out to the stadium and support this team. Okay. I will say this. Uh, the Hard Rock Stadium has been able to get 72,000 yeah, for, for games Real Madrid against Barcelona. Now they've got this coming week. Manchester United is playing Real Madrid and Bayern Munich is playing Man City. They're expecting huge crowds. If they even get a third of those people to come watch the MLS, they're going to fill the 25,000 seat stadium. This okay. is fun. This week in sports in South Florida. This is the whole new show. <laughs> All right, can we talk politics just a little bit here? The, yes. uh, the Democrats debated in Fort Myers. Michael was there. Uh, Jeff Green, Nancy, for the first time, mm -hmm. sat up on that stage. And did he make any kind of uh, dynamic inroads? I think he probably made some inroads in probably displacing a Phil Levine, mm -hmm. two rich guys. And, well, which one are you going to pick? And I'm really not sure the degree to which a Phil Levine is going to, to, to play and really be attractive outside of the South Florida, outside, outside of South Florida. Yeah, we, I don't want to, mm -hmm. for a second, sound sanctimonious about mm -hmm. the power of TV advertising, mm -hmm. but, Ed, uh, on this station and stations throughout the state, Jeff Green has spent, I think, something like $12 million of his own money yeah. on media. Now he's number two in the polls mm -hmm. and moving up. This was a Republican who ran in California. I mean, so I mean, maybe as a long time ago. Long time ago, but you know, but <laughs> the Democratic race is really it's Gwen Graham and the guys. Gwen and the men is how right. she. Gwen, Gwen and, the and the men. Gwen and, and, the and men. I think the 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 one man I do believe that has a chance to break out uh, is the mayor of Tallahassee, Andrew Gillum. I, I think that he speaks to. Uh, the Democratic Party as it is today, which is a little bit, a little further left um, mm -hmm. than just the simple liberal, typical Democratic politics. So I do think that he has a potential path. Uh, now, whether he can get the message out, it's a big state. I don't know how well yeah. funded his campaign well, is. Tom Steyer, that's the California billion, yeah, billionaire, not only gave him a million bucks, but gave him 50 campaign staffers mm -hmm. to work. And I think, I think Nancy, that mm -hmm. in fact, that gave Gillum a big, a big it boost. It gave him a big boost. I do agree with Ed that he is speaking a slightly different language than traditional Very Democrats who, who have not caught fire yeah. and who have not been able to get out enough people to the polls to, to, to get them across the finish line. So mm -hmm. he has, as I said, it's a slightly different language. And on the Republican side of the race, the, the newest independent poll that's out shows Ron DeSantis with a 12-point lead, mm -hmm. 12, 42 to 30, 12-point lead mm -hmm. over Adam Putnam. I mean, what mm -hmm. uh, the, the news of the the, the uh, agriculture secretary's office botching the gun permits mm -hmm. and then you know there's this green toxic sludge bubbling up on both coasts mm -hmm. and you know that's got to be a killer for a campaign for governor. DeSantis has a message that is now speaking to Republican voters and he's always had a message around that he is a, a principled conservative coming out of the Freedom Caucus in Congress. Now how that plays in the general we'll have to see but he does have momentum as we sit today and interesting I've seen polling numbers that say those who know that President Trump has endorsed Ron DeSantis show 20 points yeah. over Adam Putnam and those who didn't know show Putnam slightly ahead so it's it's 
the power of the president in this respect is now reaffirming Ron DeSantis as, in fact, the, the person who has the momentum. And I wouldn't be surprised if he won. Mm -hmm. Well, he is a he's an impressive, very smart guy. Yale mm -hmm. undergraduate, Harvard, Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's Jag. he's well, but mm -hmm. very Jack conservative. Core, right? And mm -hmm. after the disastrous news conference in Helsinki, one of the people who went on Fox News to say it was pretty good was Ron DeSantis. So he's not going to run away from President Trump. All right. We've got more to talk about on the roundtable, and we're going to get to that question of whether Dolphin players will be able to kneel if they want to make a social protest during the national anthem. So stick around for that. And once again, on this Sunday, we are in the midst of a roundtable. And let's move on to the question that came out this week uh, uh, all over the country and Michelle Kaufman of whether the Dolphins are going to take any punitive actions, punish any player who should want to kneel uh, during the national anthem. Sort of take us through what's going on. Right. Well, it just seems to go back and forth, back and forth. I mean, the league wants to take a stand, but then the public outcry and then they, they back off. And... That's what happened this week. I mean, I, I, I really wish that that issue would just go away and we could just get back to talking about the preseason football team and who well, are the Adam, Dolphins going to have. Adam Gase wants to get back to yes. it. He had nothing to uh, say about it. You know, it. the big debate is really, I don't think anyone questions everybody has a right to, to, it's a free country. You can make whatever demonstrations you want, but the league as a private entity and a right. private company has the right to make right. rules. So I work for the Miami Herald. The Miami Herald has the right to tell right. me that I'm not allowed to have a protest in my place of business. And, you know, you can either abide by the rule or not. So I think it's, it's, a, very, it's a very touchy issue because it touches on politics, it touches on race. Right. And uh, the league just, you know, the league really, I think, should get back to focusing on the teams and the players and the things that the fans really care most about. Right. Every time they keep bringing up this issue, it's... It's rekindling a lot of a lot of bad feelings among the fans yeah. and among the players. It is, but you know what? That's life in America. Also, mm -hmm. I agree. I think the NFL does have the right. It's a it's a private entity, 
it what it needs to do though it it is hurting cats though because you have all of these teams that are taking different approaches mm -hmm. and so what is the point of the rule well i, think I do think that this issue sorry, i'm sorry mm -hmm. i do think this issue is where it needs to be they're talking again <laughs> they're talking again what i'm all for negotiation it, yeah. what complicated and, it though is that this week stephen ross the team owner said mm -hmm. Uh, well, there will be some suspensions, right. and this will be our punitive course of action. And then he said, "Oh no, I I said it wouldn't be suspension. It was it was kind of like right, the President they Trump said, thing. Th yeah, they I, said I would or I wouldn't. And they said that the dolphins, right? The dolphins. The complication I think was a, a five-hour window where the league had told the teams that they have to put a policy in place. The dolphins opened camp early. The dolphins." put the policy down. The other teams had not, even though some obviously right. probably were going to make a policy. So the Dolphins looked really bad in this deal. And then in the end, pulled back and said, no, no, no. no. Now but we're back at the table. Right. We're talking and all of this. But Just forget this everything. This is a case management of how you yeah. mess up a simple issue. You have a great game. We should be talking about the return of Ryan Tannehill and whether the Dolphins can overtake the Patriots this year, but we're not because we, the NFL, Roger Goodell has blown this issue again. It's kind of like, you know, having a bad meal and it repeats and repeats and repeats on you. The bottom line is, is that this is just mismanagement from the NFL. And to be blunt, you guys said it best. NFL is a private, a private entity. And honestly, they can make rules and the players have to live by the rules. End of story. And we can get into the debate whether they should or shouldn't display. That's a, a First Amendment issue. I'm happy for them to say whatever they want to say. But the, as the employee, they have to abide by the rules of the league. Because it's during End the game story. time. Because it it's is. during the game it's time. Entertainment. It's during the game time. It's entertainment. Fans don't want to get, they don't want to go to a football game and spend, they want three or four hours to have escape, escape politics. from politics. Escape you know, politics. They don't want to deal with this. And they're fans, and they're right. fans that absolutely support what these African-American players are doing. And, and right. so they have got to do, they could, you know, the owners could also grow a spine and support these players. They could grow a spine, you know, well, and they, they could, could grow a spine and not, because, because the in economic impact they're killing the golden goose. The, the attendance was down, revenue was down from the league, and it goes back to this issue. So is it a and commercial so it's, issue? It's, well, it depends upon who it's boycotts whom. It's got to be a commercial whom. issue. After all, they're a commercial entity. Well, it depends it, upon who boycotts whom, though. And the it's a national the conversation. The fans who support the, the, right, the kneeling the athletes. Right, or the players want to boycott. So right. the, I think that the question then is if it's a pure economic decision right. then. If the teams have a rule, the leagues have a rule, you have to stand for the national anthem or you can't kneel. If the players or don't stay, like that, or stay, or stay in the locker room, stay in the locker room, stay in the locker room, whatever. They make their rule. If there are players that don't like the rule, mm -hmm. the players can boycott and say, "I'm not going to work." Mm -hmm. Or if they do do it, then the fans can the fans can boycott and say, "I don't support the NFL because yeah. of the stand they're or taking." And it's not just boycotting the NFL; it's boycotting their advertisers. It's not a, that's, that's not, not a good issue. All right, and that yeah. is the it's final word for this morning. Thank you so much for a really. Great round table. Hope your knee <laughs> feels better. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bazzoli had a little knee surgery this week. Still came in, so good for him. Coming up, more twisted. Stay tuned.
right, that photo. Welcome back. We are quickly warming up some spots already in the mid 90s, although we are seeing some shower activity now beginning to increase in coverage from west to east. You'll definitely notice some thunderstorms across southern portions of Miami-Dade County. Keep those umbrellas close because we are expecting showers and thunderstorms to be on the rise as we head into the afternoon hours. We're giving about a 50 to 60 percent chance of the area seeing thunderstorms, and this will linger through most of the upcoming week. Thanks, Erica. In elections coming up in just weeks and in November, we are about to see whether that March for Our Lives movement will become a march to the polls. And some numbers released this week indicate there could be a stunning strength in numbers for the newest, youngest voters. To use it, they'll have to change an historical narrative. The data analysis firm Target Smart shows a 2% increase in voter registration among 18 to 29 year olds. And that may not sound like a big deal unless you drill down into some detail. So take a look at this. This is a visual Target Smart uh, posted with its results. Look at the darker color states with the higher percentages of young people registering to vote. Florida is among them and others that we know as battleground states where elections are won by the smallest of margins. This election year, for the first time ever, the demographic known as millennials outnumbers baby boomers, two generations above them who've held the potential voter majority for 40 years. Millennials have the power to become an electoral tsunami. They just have to show up. Historically, the youngest voting bloc is the least reliable, but historically there has not been the confluence of this extreme partisan divide, a 24 hour news cycle, and the all pervasive immediate connections of social media, also a spate of mass shootings whose victims have forced national debate. Significantly, the Target Smart analysis was done just after the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High and the resulting nationwide push for attention to gun violence. And that suggests that is the big issue spurring sudden voter registration by these young adults. <clears throat> What the study doesn't address is why? Is it self-motivated engagement or maybe a response to dedicated campaigns by political groups? Well, come election day, no one is required to vote. No one is forced into the booth. It is no day off or holiday to give time to get it done. So who will use their civic strength this election season? Stay tuned. What do you think? We'd love to hear from you online. Anywhere, email, Twitter, Facebook, we're very easy to find. And we love hearing from you and we'll respond. Remember, stay informed, get involved, and have a great Sunday.